Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci, in some sense, is the one that clarified that intellectual work has become dominant and is going to become dominant in advanced industrial, post -industrial, post -industrial revolution society. So lots of people carry out intellectual work where the use of the brain um, becomes dominant uh, and uh, pure brute force, animal force is becoming uh, irrelevant. Then the other is the use of intellectual that is traditional, the people that have learned a lot, studied a lot, fought a lot and try to use their brain and logical ability with a bit of coherence. So it's very hard to decide which one of the two words we want to use. You tell me. No, I was I was just uh, let's say introducing your uh, yeah in a sense your experience with this uh, uh, because they are let's say like they lay the theoretical foundations upon which uh, in, in one case Lega and in the other case uh, the let's say uh, more populist wing of the Demo Italian Democratic Party. Uh, basically build their policies so in a sense but um i mean uh, i don't know if i want to be carried away with this debate on the role of the intellectual <laughs> oh, I, will, I will ask something about the intellectuals later but it's more related about uh, paul krugman and stiglitz because i think they are far more interesting uh in their role uh, with uh, in the role uh, um with the uh arise of uh trumpism but Nevertheless, uh, so um, would it be possible to, let's say, follow the order of the um, questions that we laid out uh, previously? I was going to suggest that, yes. Do you have them or do you want me to read them? Oh, I certainly have it here in the mail. Uh, oh, no, no, I was to... asking Ludovico, don't worry, uh, we have everything ready. <laughs> Uh, okay, if you want to repeat it for those listening, I have them here in your invitation mail of a few days ago, so they're fine with me. If I haven't read them, the, the, my interrupting you on the intellectual is not irrelevant, but uh, let's get to the question. You will see why it is relevant. Hmm. Okay, so the first question, I mean, I would have, I would have uh, uh, let the people who created, let's say, who elaborated these questions ask them but sure. some of them are not here so... i think it's better if we ask the questions okay. we already have in order okay. not to create confusion yeah yeah sure so the first one was uh if it was possible to distinguish between a left wing and right wing populism and if they have different origins uh, or uh, foundational let's say uh, concepts uh, that sort of things um okay so in fact uh there is a sense in which they have some in, uh, different origins. Mm. But this is true only for the extremes of the populist uh, spectrum. There is the very far right uh, populist position, which is not really, I'm not willing to call it populist. Okay, first of all, which is why, let, let's start from a definition. At least let me define the words I use, okay? In the way I use it. I define populist, a political uh, position or a social theory, if you want, that uh, uh, proposes solution to social problems that are patently impossible in the light of common knowledge, okay? So populism is a very particular, otherwise we use the term too generically to mean anything that we don't agree with anything that seems to have the support of people not well educated, anything that implies screaming a bit and saying big words, uh, anything that rally the masses uh, according to emotion. And then it becomes the classic uh, Hegelian night in which everything is gray and you can't distinguish one thing from another. So I use the word populist when I say, oh, that's pure populism. When somebody says, Oh, the world is full of poor people. We cannot stand poverty anymore. This is a shame. It's 2020. Now it's actually 2021. We cannot, uh, we are a rich society. We just send another super uh, vessels on Mars. How is that possible that millions of people do not have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, heating and, and, and air conditioning at home and live in a decent house and have a, a decent education, all right? 
let's stop this by redistributing the wealth of the top 0.1 or 0.01% wealthiest people in the world to the other, and this will get rid of poverty. Yeah, that's an, so this is a, it's an extreme. I just gave you an extreme version, but it's very common. You will, every year when the Oxford, uh, what was that? Uh, that uh, OMG, Oxfam, the, Oxfam uh, inequality Oxfam, right, no, Oxfam, report, sorry. Oxfam um, uh, ONGs comes out with its report. You have thousands, tens of thousands of people in the world that start screaming this. Now, this is an idiocy. This is pure populism. Why? Because all you have to do is two plus two, and you realize that even if you could actually, say, take Bezos $200 billion in paper wealth or in stock market wealth and cash it in at that value and then redistribute those 200 billion to the poor people in the world, yeah, that would be just not a drop of water in the ocean, but let's say a bathtub in the ocean. All right, would have no effect. So that's populism. I don't say it's populism if somebody says, I want socialism. I want to appropriate uh, I want to eliminate private property of uh, companies and firms and means of production, redistribute it, and have it controlled by elected officials. I can find it crazy. I may decide it doesn't work. I can try to say, hey, look, they tried here, they tried there, it's got this problem, it's got this other problem. But I don't classify that as populist. Okay, so that's just to understand. So in some sense, what we call the extreme populist left, say in Italy, if I look at look at the name, uh, the names. This seem to be mostly Italians uh, uh, people. I don't see any non-Italian uh, first or last name. In Italy, this would be say Potere al Popolo, or some uh, 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 components of what's called uh, Liberi Uguali. Okay, uh, I don't classify those as popular. Those are strictly Marxist-Leninist position. There is thought about it. The thought is confused. A lot of assumptions are wrong. Uh, we can debate about it, but they don't violate strictly uh, common sense. And funny enough, let me say it, funny enough, this is true also on the extreme right. Uh, I hate to repeat, so don't, you know, <laughs> I'm quoting, I'm not endorsing. Um, but if one says, uh, I want a country made only of people of Italian origins and background, everybody has to speak Italian and have studied the classics. I don't want color people, color, let's say black or Asian people living in the country and they have to be repelled. I want an authoritarian state, blah, blah, blah. That is, if one is just playing fascist, uh, Forza Nuova style, say, to speak about things that exist right now, I can, you know, find them dangerous, I can uh, find them despicable, but I don't think they're populist because the thing that they are proposing are actually doable. They are insane, but they're doable. It's, I think it's quite important, okay? And that extreme left, that extreme right have profoundly different uh, intellectual backgrounds. One is Marxist-Leninist, the others come from a tradition of racism, of special status of the West uh, European people and within that of the Mediterranean uh, uh, Italian one because of our class, supposedly classical background for the idea that we are the uh, country that inherited the tradition of the classical world, both Greek and Roman and so on and so forth. And on various uh, theories of racial superiority, racial destiny and so on. Completely different things. Okay, so those are actually do not have a common background. And then you have the true populism, which is that, uh, I don't know, uh, strange soup that in Italy has been perf perfectly represented by a piece of Lega and a piece of the Five Star Movement and has now extended like a virus to affect completely the Partito Democratico and other components. Those actually do have a common uh, background. And the common background is essentially in the tentative, uh, this would surprise you, it's not ideological. I think the common background is in the aspiration to get political power by selling people nonsense. 
the reason, if you, you know, you mentioned Emmanuel at the beginning, I don't want to make much of a victim of him or a subject of this conversation, but Emmanuel is a good example. When your desire, as Dimayo is a good example, as Banya is a good example, as, a, uh, I mean, everybody that you mentioned are good examples and, and more and more. I mean, Rinaldi is probably the, the best. This is a man of profound ignorance that comes from the Roman upper class, very upper class, uh, that has worked and, and, and tried to make money completely inside what you would call, uh, uh, I don't know, the, 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 what he would call the I don't know, regime or the, uh, um, you know, the bad guys he's supposedly fighting. And then has invented a, a rhetoric that simply sell people pseudo solution to real problem. First of all, magnifies the real problem, transforms them in monstruosity, and then says, well, here you go. Here is an aspirin that will cure all your cancers. You get, you don't have one cancer, you actually have 72. The poor darling has actually one, but he has transformed into 72. And the aspirin that I am selling you will, uh, will solve all of it. Interestingly, my, my own interaction with these people and debates and also reading and looking what happens around the world is, has led me to believe that actually they don't have an ideological background. And you have the proof these days. You have the proof these days. They have turned around. I mean, this has been perfect. I was thinking at this when I was reading your question. I said, what they're doing right now in the Italian parliament is like fantastic. It shows that there is really no ideology other than try to grab political power by fooling people. That's it. I don't think there is anything more than that. Because the excuses, the argument, the, 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 the uh, theories that are uh, used from time to time change. And you see how instrumental they are, how invented they are, how picked up uh, uh, instrumentally they are according to the rhetoric of the moment. And therefore, how can you take them seriously? How can you believe that uh, somebody like Alberto Bagnai has actually a coherent vision of the world? The guy theorized communism and the proletarian revolution for a long time. <laughs> I mean, then he's moved to theorize that everything was the Euro fault, even his own cold and my, uh, and my yearly influenza, that if there was bad weather, you know, in Liguria was due to the Euro and they're getting out of the Euro would solve everything, would be the simplest thing, unemployment would be gone. And now he has decided that, oh, he loves the Euro. He always did. He always wanted to support and make it better. You understand, there's no ideology around that. So that's, that's, that's a position I take very seriously, which also has to do what I said before. No, no, this is an intellectual. In the serious sense of the word, they do intellectual work in the sense that they don't work in the, in the farm, unfortunately. There are beautiful hands stolen from agriculture, um, but uh, they are not intellectual in the other sense, in the sense of being coherent people that investigate what's happening in the world. And you know, you can change your mind. I've changed my mind a few times around specific issues of the world, but you do it because the facts convince you otherwise. Uh... Yeah, so uh, in a sense, uh, I perfectly agree, especially with the latter part, uh, because there is uh, also evidence from psychological studies. I, I think I saw a uh, paper on psychology today that says uh, uh, affiliates of political parties uh, um, basically uh, can, let's say, swing from one position to the other according to what the party tells them. Uh, they are, I don't know... Uh, I don't know exactly what to say it has okay, happened. Well, I give you what they what they say. They're sheep. They want uh, to be a team, and the team has to win. Yeah, in a sense, but because my let's say the, the concern that my concern with this is uh, why are people willingly being fooled by such a feeble rhetoric? Because if one, I believe, I mean, one can believe. Uh, some theories uh, promoted by uh, populists, but if he's generally interested in them, he looks at them with a critical lens, let's say, uh, he's able to find their faults there. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are quite evident. I mean, if one reads about the modern monetary theory or other uh, uh, theories used by by uh, populist politicians of all kinds, then it will find that 
there is quite a lot of it's quite problematic so um i mean why in, why do you believe there are so many people willingly being fooled by by populist parties because populist doesn't work so in a sense the, okay the, the, the answer in this question is not easy the, why so many people follow populist position during certain periods of time or certain periods in history and those same people or their parents if you want but people that you would define you know anthropologically and socially altogether similar to them um did not do it um 40 years before uh, i have a hard time to answer you okay um I have some ideas, but uh, I am already I already started late and I tend to elaborate points and make them very detailed. If I go down that path, I'm going to keep your audience here for a while. I have nothing against. I do enjoy intellectual debate, so uh, I'm happy to stay here for as long as it takes. But I'm not sure why I'm not sure your your the rest of the audience uh, likes the idea. Why am I saying this? Because trying to understand this means trying to understand how the relation between elites, various kinds of elites, social, intellectual, political, religious elites, and the population has evolved over time. And how certain elites have actually, uh, how can I say, abdicated to their elite role. You see, populism is not a generalized phenomenon around even the Western world. We have had a populist phenomenon here in the United States with Trump. Um, and uh, it has had certain characteristics. Italian politics has been dominated by various forms of politics, uh, sorry, populism, essentially since 1993, 94. Berlusconi is, in fact, the person that practically ideologically breakthrough open open uh, uh, Italian politics to populism. And this is not by chance. It's because the previous uh, political system, the previous elite has completely failed, has generated no substitute and is unable to provide uh, a credible solution to their mistakes. Um, if you look at Spain, if you look at France, if you look at Germany, you don't have populist phenomena comparable to Italy. It's incorrect to treat Le Pen as a five star or even the populist component of the Lega. It's incorrect to treat Podemos like five star. Podemos is essentially a late Marxist uh, Gavarist movement with a very strong uh, Marxist view affected by, I, that's why I say Gavarist, uh, the particular interpretation or the particular changes that uh, Marxist-Leninism has had in Latin America. But it's not a populist movement. In fact, they're governing with the PSOE and, you know, they're doing it. They're not, I disagree with many of the things they say and do, but that's a different story. What they put on the table are a coherent set of arguments. They're pursuing a coherent political line uh, no, they're not populist. And even the German extreme right, of which we are all afraid, right? Because obviously, you know, if it grows, if it comes from Germany, everybody starts seeing spectra of, of Nazism and so on. They might even be Nazi if you want. But Nazism was not populist, it was an insanity, but it wasn't populist. And, I, and please take my words as the objective word of somebody that studied this thing. In fact, they did what they claimed they wanted to do, including trying to exterminate the Jewry, the Jews. Okay? Think about it. I mean, you can't solve unemployment by getting out of the Euro. All right? Even if you do it, you'll fail. But you can try to kill all the Jews that are living in the territories you control, and they did. The second is a monstrosity, is, 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 is a criminal thing, but it's not populism. <laughs> you have to be a bit cynic on this, but you better follow this. Otherwise, we, we mix up things and we get confused. So populism is a phenomenon restricted to a certain set of uh, countries. And I think the main reason is the failure of the socioeconomic and intellectual elites of those countries to present the population, because there is always in every country. 
a very weak portion of the population, intellectually weak, socially weak, culturally weak, unable essentially to understand what's happening in the world. This was true 300 years ago. It's in some sense even more dramatically true now because now everybody participates in the political decision process, but the process has become, and, and the world has become so infinitely more complex that in some sense, the, 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 the farmer or, or, the, or the laborer of, uh, I don't know, uh, the poor area in 1870, that, all, that he knew was that there was the landlord, the landlord was the son of a bitch that always asked too much and he had to work very hard and he had too many children and that's it. And the solution was to, to fight with the landlord. It was obviously much more ignorant than the average voter of uh, five star right now, but the world he faced was simpler. And so the, the, the gap between his understanding of the world and the complexity of the world was smaller than the understanding of the world of the average Italian with a 95 IQ, with a bad education like everybody that gets out from an Italian school on average gets, and the complexity of understanding what's going on today. Yeah, I know, I say very strong words, but you, better, you want to try to understand the problems, you better look at them. Never forget that 50% of the population has an IQ and a cognitive ability that is at 100 or below. It's a fact. And so these people need to be treated and uh, appropriate needs to be given explanation and, and, and needed to be informed appropriately and are extremely susceptible to Dr. Dulcamara. And when the elite fails to do its job, this portion of the population, which is very large, fails immediately prey of the populist thing. Remember, the relation between the uneducated person with weak cognitive abilities and the elite is an el a relation of trust. It's not a relation of understanding. Somebody with an IQ of 95 and the uh, high school Italian knowledge cannot possibly understand how the European Central Bank works, no matter how hard you try to explain. So his or her acceptance that it's a good idea to stay in the European Central Bank has to do with you generating trust in them, with you behaving appropriately, with you giving them rewards for the choice they make. If you fail, then they go to the opposite and they say, you are the enemy, you're the source of their problem, and therefore the euro has to be destroyed. It's as simple as that. You cannot walk them through, you know, uh, financial stability, inflation, uh, mutual insurance. That's way too complicated. May I ask a question following this, if Ludovico is okay with you? Yes, yes. Um, uh, okay, so I was, I have been wondering for a while since you said that then populism does have this weak ideological core that basically goes wherever it's more convenient. Um, is it possible that this way of behaving is also affecting the established, let's say, mainstream parties in which should have an ideology or like a strong ideological core with respect to populism? Like, is it possible that being faced with the challenge of populism, they might be losing this ideological core as well? Um, Beatrice, I'm not sure I understood uh, exactly what you're asking me. Uh, well, so you, well, try to say it again because I'm not sure I understood. You linking a, a, a law. Let me try if I understood it correctly. You're saying one factor that makes uh, um, uh, populist position more attractive. Uh, to a number of people is the fact that what you would call the traditional elite have been losing their ideological core? Uh, not exactly. I was more ah, okay. thinking about uh, the fact that mainstream parties are faced with uh, populist parties and they see populist parties winning over the people. And so also the mainstream parties start to adopt populism as a way to attract votes. And in doing so, they lose their ideological core. I'm just asking if that's oh, I if that see. could um, be a thing that could happen or is happening. Well, certainly this has certainly happened. 
Um, my opinion, part is the reason you said, therefore showing they did not have an ideological core. If I see politicians or uh, political organization that for years had advocated certain policies, a certain views of the world switching quite suddenly to a populist position, and then I have to conclude that they kept that position in a purely instrumental way because they thought it was the best way to get to power. And now they've changed their opinion. They're looking for other positions to get to power. And the ideological core was not there, which is why I say, you know, Frato Yanni is an individual much more coherent politically, much less populist than a Zingaretti just to be very explicit, or in Orlando. Why? Because Frato Yanni keeps repeating his Marxist proletarian revolution over and over and over, has been doing that for 30 years. And even if he gets very few votes, he keeps doing it. You may claim he's confused, you may claim he's blind, you may claim he's driven by ideological priors, all those things. But you cannot claim he's a populist, the switches position just because he thinks that uh, a new version of, uh, uh, Pseudo aspirin will attract more votes. You see what I mean? Um, so, yes, there is a part, but I think that that component, which has happened a bit everywhere, uh, in Italy, I think the PD has been, the, so it's hard to say, right? So, PD certainly has been incredibly uh, shocking, even to me. I mean, I know the people in that party, I know their culture. I don't know if you're, uh, Guess no, but I, when I was very young, younger than you, uh, when I was uh, between 18 and 19, I became uh, uh, the leader of the Itali of the Federazione Giovanile Comunista Italiana of uh, Venice and Veneto, and uh, became a, an employee of the Communist Party and leave the politics from inside as a professional for three years. And then I left in disgust. Well, in disgust, yeah, partly in disgust, partly because I, I completely realized that that made no sense and that those were not arguments we pursued. And so, but I've known that word since and I've followed them and I still know a lot of them. Um, and, uh, and I was not particularly surprised that uh, there was this, uh, this shift. Uh, it was, I think, coherent with what I have been observing since the, the fall of the wall and the construction of DS and so on. Uh, of Berlusconi, I already said. In some sense, the most surprising thing was the strange choice of large part of what was traditionally the Lega to become supporter of a form of national populism that was clearly instrumental to capture votes. And that was completely orthogonal to anything they had been preaching for 20 years and which that built the party. And so that suggested to me that in some sense there is all, there is partly this kind of a, uh, ad hoc or instrumental or power seeking element right? That is, I switch position because I think that gets more votes. But I think also that the, what we call the populist in Italy won an intellectual battle. I mean, it's not very intellectual, but they won an informational and cultural battle by the, because uh, their main arguments that Italy is being mistreated, that, that Italy is a victim of the foreign countries, of the Euro, that the Germans have uh, elaborated the whole thing of the Europe, the European Union to exploit us and export, that the black people arriving from Africa is a plan to suppress the Italian demographically, you know, all these things uh, have clearly won. They won. They are accepted as common wisdom. And that's I think why then you saw people like Emanuele Felice all of a sudden switch. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. It was very interesting analysis. I didn't really see it. Like, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, we, no, actually, no we are here to, uh, to debate. <laughs> we have a question from one of the participants, Alice. Uh, she would like to know your point of view on democracy. Oh, my Lord. 
Alicia, that's uh, I mean, you want to keep me here for what three days? <laughs> uh, it would be uh, is that for is that part of the deal that I don't see the people I'm talking to? I wouldn't mind to see the people I'm talking to, I mean, it's just me. Um, yeah, yes. Um, I don't know if Alicia can turn around. Aaron no, no, just directly. not just Alicia, everybody. I mean, it's a uh, it's a Let's nice see if our work connection impression kind of talking to a bunch of people, not to a bunch of symbols. <laughs> Yeah, it's just to make sure uh, that everyone's connection. Look, works. my opinion on demography in demography on democracy, try to make it simpler, is exactly Churchill. And actually, having read a bit of Churchill, it's it's more than exactly, it's quite close. Um, you know, it's terrible, it doesn't work, but it beats all the others. Uh, the democracy, yeah, so I think democracy is fine. There's, there's nothing that beats it. Uh, and for me, democracy is just the fact that when we vote, when we vote, a vote is a vote and a person is a vote, period. The rest, the electoral law, the institutional organization, if it is presidential or not, if it is there is one chamber in parliament or two, if the prime minister is, uh, has to be elected directly or indirectly, if uh, the condition under which it resigns and so on and so forth. Uh, that's all debatable. It's not part of what we call democracy. If you want to understand uh, the problem from a technical point of view that has influenced me a lot, and there is a beautiful book. It's a bit technical, but it's worth reading. And it's called um, Liberalism Against Populism. Uh, and the author is Bill Riker, William Riker. William was, uh, when I was a PhD student, in uh, Rochester between 83 and 86. The economics department was hosted in a building called Harkness Hall. And there were two departments in the building, economics and above us there was political science. And those two mm, departments were extremely connected and linked, still they are. In fact, they run together a common research center and it's a lot of interaction because the two big men that had created the departments in the late 50s were great friends and true intellectual. One was Lionel McKenzie, my advisor, and the other was Bill Riker. And Bill and Lionel were strictly very close friends. And so we took classes in both and, and, and so on. And political science uh, at Rochester was, uh, was, uh, was quite formal. There was a lot of work on theory and so on. And at that point of that book, which I invite everybody that wants to understand the process to, to read and study, is that one of the foundation of populism, in fact, is that there exists such a thing as the people, the will of the people, and that the will of the people expresses itself and it's right, and it is the will of the people that gets the country going in the right direction. And what Bill correctly points out, which is an obvious historical fact, is that there is no such a thing as the people. There is the population of a country and there is the electoral votes, but then there are very different peoples with very different interests, cultures, values, and conflicts of interest. The most of what uh, political choices do is to redistribute, not just wealth, power, role, values, you know, if I prohibit abortion or I allow it, if I make it mandatory, if I make it under certain condition or other, and so on, so what am I doing? I'm redistributing freedom and power from a set of ideological position to another set, right? And therefore, there is no such a thing as the will of the people, that is the will of different people or that are, Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they intersect, sometimes they're completely disjoint. It's very complicated. And the, and the more articulated, the, the, the wider is the, the division of labor, the wider is the complexity of the electoral body. Political system, institutions, right? Filter this, our mechanism, the filter, this heterogeneity and produces outcome and produce outcome, right? So it's just silly to say democracy, express the will of the people, it's nonsense. I mean, I, but let's be clear, I grew up believing that nonsense, you know, the 68, 69 and uh, early 70s, 
you know, I was in potato peri, avant-garde peri, all that, all shortly, always got out on time. Uh, but it was useful. I learned that, you know. So uh, but if you talk to me when I was 18, I thought that the true way of expressing democracy and was to have the assembly of the student my lyceum, having me go up on the cathedra, scream some nonsense, and because they liked me, pl applaud, and I was the leader, and that was great. I was representing the will of the people. Um, it was a good shot of adrenaline, and uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then you think about me, says, wow, that's nonsense. Then you go back to your own class and with your friends, and you realize that some of the people that are actually your friend privately says, Michele, that was, you know, I don't agree. I mean, I didn't say anything, but I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Right? Um, anyhow, so what does this mean? It means that we shouldn't talk about democracy, just generally. Democracy is the fact that when we vote, everybody has the right to vote, and one vote is one. End of story. We should talk about the details of our institutional system and the way it stratifies opinion, the way in which it selects them and how it gives way to this and that, and how it lets certain interests to be represented. We have to look at the mechanism, at the details of the mechanism, if we want to understand how it works. We Talking just generically about democracy, if you want, is a way of opening the door to populism. Because it's obvious, right? If you start talking about a generic democracy, think about it. It's obvious that you have to say that democracy is good. What do you want to say? That you and me have the right to decide for everybody because we're like cuter or smarter or we have a better first name, right? So everybody has to participate in the decision process and the decision process has to express the will of the majority, right? That's the second step. And if the majority says so, that we have to do so. End of story. I remember the debate with this character that has fortunately disappeared, but it's a good point about intellectual and intellectual. You probably have heard of somebody called Flavio Tosi. He was for a long time the mayor of Verona. He was a member of the Lega before he was a member of the uh, fascist party, whatever the name was, uh, Forza, Forza something, okay? Not Forza Italia, but Forza something, uh, um, MSA. And at a certain point, people saw it because as a good populist, he was very capable in dressing himself in his speech and use very moderate terms as the alternative to Salvini, the good alternative to Salvini, because he was a reasonable man. And so in the brief period in which I was trying to represent the people connected with Fare and associated with Fare after the Giannino disaster, I was asked to do a public debate with him. And in the middle of the public debate, the guy, in total, I think, sincerity, he didn't really realize what kind of nonsense he was coming up, started to claim that it made no sense that this and that was not true in Italy, even if we knew that the majority wanted it. And that certain constitutional reform had not taken place because even if the majority wanted, the people want to change. I said, you know, stop. Constitution not about things you change with 51 or 50.01% of the vote, they, are, they, are, they play a different role. And, and the guy during the debate kept insisting the fact that I was a clear representative of a, 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 a what did you call it, global uh, aristocracy, the one that to prevent the people from changing Italy as they uh, chosen to do, and that the will of the people had to be, and I mean, I gave up on trying to explain to him, William Riker, uh, but then after I, at, at lunch, I actually went down pretty seriously and, and gave him a bit, of a, you know, bouldering style professorial lecture saying, shut up and listen. Okay. Uh, literally, I just, 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 just cued il becco sta zitto, che mi spiego. Non hai capito un cazzo. Okay. Uh, and all right. I did my part, which I think is what you had to do. During the debate, I, we had a few hundred people in, in the middle. I had to explain that. You know, if we had not moved to a completely presidential system with direct election of the president, it was because we had to change the constitution completely and change the constitution completely and making it to Italy into a copy of, of, of United States. This was about 2013, 2014. Could certainly be done, but require a step, a set of procedure and a general agreement that was beyond the fact that 
not even in terms of votes, but only in terms of seats during a certain period, the group, the coalition you belong to at the majority of the parliament. That's just not enough. That's not the way you do it in a liberal democracy. But I think he was sincerely not aware of that. He was sincerely not aware of that, which is why actually at lunch eventually he did shut up uh, and listen. Um, uh, and so, that's the message. Uh, and that's why the elites have to play a role, you see. These are not simple arguments. You are probably part of the elite or trying to become part of the elite or learning to become part of the elite. And your role is to recognize that complex things have to be explained even the simple-minded. And that's the duty of, uh, of the intellectual elite. When the intellectual elite abdicates to that duty, then you have uh, the Rinaldi running the country. So, uh, Professor, I, we have another question from our audience. I think you partially answered to it, but I will ask it again. Um, how can a democracy, which relies also on the people you mentioned with an IQ lower than 100, survive without populism? Do you think that populism is inevitable in a certain way to communicate with the majority? No, it's not. Look at Germany. Look at a lot of countries. One could argue that those I mean, have more, a better more, system of education. Partly it's education, partly it's, I repeat, the fact that elites take their role seriously. Elites means take their role seriously means they resign when they make mistake. You see? They don't they don't let a certain view that it's all a trick, that nothing is serious, that the rules are 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 there only for the poor people spread out, like in Italy. You know. Having minister and powerful people that resigns because they cheated or because they, 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 they plagiarized their thesis is a way in which you establish collective reputation. Having people retiring from politics when they get defeated is where, the way in which you establish collective reputation. You cannot have people, you know, Renzi is a classical example, saying this thing and then doing repeatedly the opposite. I don't see populism as uh, inevitable. It's certainly a much bitter, a bigger, sorry, not bitter, well, also bitter, but bigger risk today than it was uh, 50 years ago because the diffusion of instruments like the one we're using and what we call the social, the internet, has created a much bigger potential for uh, the Dr. Dulcamara to spread their words and for people that have a little understanding of, uh, of the world to believe that they do and interact. But it also has created strong option for other people to speak freely and to teach and to explain and to take responsibility. So certainly it has increased volatility if you want, right? The, op the opportunities to go the wrong way have increased, but also the opportunities to go the right way have increased. It's just a bigger risk. But there's nothing automatic. And again, I invite you to look at Spain. Not because it's a model, but because it shows our country extremely similar to Italy. In fact, weaker from a lot of other points of view. Okay. Uh, is managing to avoid populism, even if they're doing crazy politics, but, but they're avoiding populism. That, that's all I care in this debate. I mean, for, for this, uh, um, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm receiving a lot of questions. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with them. Um, so Tommaso Tonello asks, since populism has been around for almost 30 years, uh, at least in Italy, Shouldn't we consider it a new stage of democracy rather than an anomaly as it, it is often been described? Uh, say it again, because some of your words came. Uh... Sorry, uh, okay, tell me if you can So we consider? Uh, since populism has been around for almost 30 years, at least in Italy, shouldn't we consider it a, a new stage of democracy rather than an anomaly as it has, uh, it has been described many times? It's not been around, it's been the dominant force for 30 years. It's always been around. 
I mean, you're studious people. You go back and study the movimento dell'uomo qualunque. Led by Guareschi. Populist position always been there. Always. So it's certainly a part of politics. It's a natural part of politics. I mean, populism was there even when there was no democracy. The various forms of rebellion led by millenaristic uh, statement and promises of cleansing up the world and expelling all the rich and bad and the nasty and the devil of late middle age and early modern era were populist. You see what I mean? So, yes, thank uh, you. yeah, I'm not saying it's new, it's old. Uh, it's always been there. The question that we have to ask is, uh, how does it become relevant? That's the question you want to ask. You will find populist position in Italian politics all across. In fact, a huge component of populism was there in the fascist uh, uh, movement and a huge component of populism was there in the Risorgimento uh, narrative. The, the, and when it became dominant, which it did, it created disaster. Why? Because it uh, led the country to do something impossible. I mean, Italy going into war both times was the outcome of populism. So if you study carefully and read, literally read what the preacher of interventism in the First World War and then of the decision to go to war with the, with the Germans in the second, preached and advocated and claimed, you will see that it just it's not that it is extreme, that it's bad, that these guys want war and blood and kill people. No, no, no. Just take it cynical. Look at it and say, is what they're saying feasible? And the answer is no. Spezzeremo le regni alla Grecia was just bullshit, was populist bullshit. Why? Because the Italian army was absolutely incapable to spezzare the regni to anybody but themselves. Yeah, you laugh, but I, I say it in an ironic way, but it's a fact. And the same is true in the first. Oh, we have to complete the Risorgimento. We will do this, we will do that. Bang, bang, bang. They sunk the fucking Navy uh, in two seconds. Yeah, uh, Beatrice, sorry, but I speak French very often. Uh, um, uh, 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 you know, we got defeated left and right and not being for the other guys that did their job on the France, uh, uh, French uh, Germany uh, border, we would have lost that one too. And the idea that this would have given us a role in the, among the great nations was also nonsense because that depended on your industrial and economic power. Italy was an underdeveloped agricultural country, war or not war. You're not gonna build metallurgical plants and chemical plants and, 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 and factories and manage, uh, you know, like England or, or Germany at the time or even France, just because you go to war and kill a few Austrians, right? You don't have an industrial base. You don't have an industrial basis. You can keep claiming that you wanna be among the great nations of the world, but hey, sorry guys, you're not gonna become a great nation of the world because you get half a million of your poor people killed. So that was populism, literally. It was popular because it was sheer nonsense. Sheer nonsense. And so no populism was always there. It's always there. And it is in fact to do with, you know, it's especially World War I, but I would say World War II as well. If you go read the Felice and the, the secret exchanges, the political the Italian industrial that uh, fell trap or the idea that by they would have got money from uh, the government because of military output and blah, blah, blah. You know, the, 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 the elites just gave up on their role, didn't stop the craziness. And the populists led us to war. This is not to say that all wars are, 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 are the outcome of populism. I say in the specific case of Italy, those two were certainly the product of populist position winning over the political fight and, and leading the country with that. Thank you. Uh, I think that Ludovico had a question, right? You have the floor. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Uh, no, basically, since I received also some, uh, the messages of some people that pointed out the fact that um, talking about the problem of, let's say, 
lower than average uh, cognitive capabilities. Also, the, there is, let's say, um, I believe it's called the Flynn effect. So that um, basically since the IQ is a standardized model, uh, is normalized, uh, it just shows that someone is above or, be, or uh, below the average, but the actual score, let's say, of the IQ tests uh, is going up. And in, in fact, for instance... Uh, it also so started, let me update you. It started also to go down. The Flynn effect is over, but yes, let's go on. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but it doesn't no, change. Exactly. It just happens to be... Uh, so, and also, uh, let's say the... Um, so there is a concrete way of uplifting even those who are, uh, let's say, in a worse shape, uh, intellectually speaking. For instance, uh, uh, in The Hive Mind by Garrett Jones, um, it is, uh, let's say, uh, framed... Um, uh, well, there is a framework uh, for... Uh, uh, people that want, want exactly to, let's say, uplift the, uh, uh, even those who are less cognitively uh, endowed. And the, the sense that you, let's say, in, uh, embed these people into, um, let's say, institutional framework, whether it is political or uh, uh, in the labor market, etc., that allows them to perform uh, their task uh, or uh, take decisions, etc. Uh, let's say uh, by enhancing their own capabilities through, for instance, the peer effect. So people gather together and uh, the uh, people are influenced by uh, the more sh the sharper ones. Um, people use better technological tools to produce more, even though they might not, they might have not been able to do that um, if the work was, I don't know, that of the artisan, that of the artist that create with their own uh, means, basically. So I'm not sure I understood the, the, the last part, but for the first that I know quite a bit. Uh, the Flynn effect is no problem. There has been a bit of Flynn effect. There is no doubt. Uh, cognitive abilities are heavily dependent on our health, uh, there's been there's plenty of medical evidence that uh, shows that health and um, condition of living in general, uh, food, uh, um, diet, uh, especially in early age, can improve your your cognitive ability. So there is no doubt. So there's nothing strange in what was observed, which is essentially that for uh, the few generations, two or three, there were those where uh, essentially almost everybody reached what we now consider high quality living, good food, uh, no, no lack of proteins, no lack of iodium and, and things like that. Uh, there was a slight movement to the right of the distribution of cognitive ability. There is also a, a relevant literature that you can certainly find by just looking at Flynn effect reversal uh, in people in the neuroscience showing that it's flattened out and probably has even a little bit decreased, but that's irrelevant. What, what matters is that it has flattened out. Uh, but the amount of the Flynn effect is small. It's not gonna change the picture. Uh, it doesn't imply that you shouldn't work to see if there are ways uh, to improve in general cognitive abilities, given the cognitive abilities have become crucial in living in our advanced society will be more and more crucial in the in the decades to come, no doubt about, no doubt about. But it doesn't change the standard deviation, you see. The damn distribution keep being normal and keep having a very stable standard deviation. And that's all that matters. If you want to learn, uh, have a good background on this, there is a beautiful book by a friend um, that was um, that came up uh, a few years ago. I don't, I don't remember when Russell uh, Russell. So the author is uh, Russell Warren, W A R N E, and the title of um, book is In the Know. It's a good survey of the myths 
and mistakes and common mistake about uh, cognitive abilities and IQ. It also tries to explain to you what it is and what sense it's measured and what's the function of G and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it gets a bit technical, but you should, okay? And it provides abundant literature on uh, that you can consult by yourself and it's pretty up to date. It's a very recent book. I don't remember if it published last year or two years ago. Or, but, um, yeah, it's worth reading and, and you'll get a more precise thing. So that's for uh, IQ per se. Now, my argument about democracy obviously has to do with the IQ because that's a very easy thing to measure and observe and, 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 and it's being measured across the world in every country, left and right, uh, for decades now in more and more sophisticated way. And we have no doubt that that distribution is there and we better face it. But obviously it's not the only component. And again, repeating, you know, oh, I know a lot of very intelligent people from such and such uh, uh, social group that nevertheless are ignorant and believe strange ways because they did not have the chance to be educated has no relevance does not bear on the debate of why did these people listen to the populist message. It has relevance on social policy you may advocate in the future or try to implement, but it doesn't change the fact that these people did vote for Di Maio, that these people did support Rinaldi, that these people did go in the square and said nonsense and, 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 and committed even an act of violence. It certainly you know, did the damage they did. Be careful, don't use moralism or, or, or goodwill or, or, or what's called, I think correctly, buonismo uh, as a coverage that eliminates responsibilities, political responsibility, political responsibility. If you vote for, 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 for Conte, if you support uh, a character like that, you support a character like that. I don't care if it is because you were poorly educated because your father was an alcoholic, but you're a smart guy. So what? Right? So what? That may tell me that in the future, I will have to advocate uh, educational policy for this or this other type of people. Doesn't eliminate the fact that you just made the wrong political choice. And the reason you did is because you didn't understand what's going on. It's because you believe that the Copri Fuoco at 10 p.m. is gonna save the country from uh, the spreading of the virus, which means you're stupid. Just stupid. You turn off your brain. I don't care why. You see, you gotta. You want to be an analyst of things. You gotta separate things. You can't mix. You can't mix. So that's the main point of me bringing up the IQ. It's 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 a it's a metonymic uh, strategy. of I'm mentioning a part, as if you want a small part, for a whole complex of things. And the whole complex of thing is that. that you always have in our society, even by motivation, a lot of people that just are maybe are smart, but just don't care. Instinctively, they don't read Damasio, right? Instinctively, they don't care. They rather watch a porno movie. They rather watch uh, a, a football thing. They rather watch some adventure stories. They're very smart when they go into the factory and, and run, and run and the production line. Very smart but their passion leads them to ignore social issue and politics, okay? And therefore they're completely disinformed. You know, I have an example. So I have a friend, you probably heard, he's, he's a very famous guy. When I told my son that I met the guy 20 years ago and we become friends, he said, Jesus, that guy is like God. You know, his name is Massimo Colomban. Yeah, he's, um, he's older than me, he's getting to 70. Uh, he's a very fairly wealthy guy from Conegliano. And he is the creator or, uh, of, um, he's the inventor of various techniques to build skyscraper and the utilization of steel and glass in build skyscraper that has made him world famous, okay? And he's not a, a dumb guy at all. If anything, he has an IQ like mine or higher. I mean, I've, I've been interacting with him for years and Massimo is very smart. But he's completely incapable of understanding politics. He doesn't care, He's all, you know, he cares about his wealth, his companies uh, and this and that. 
and if that is full prey of all the populist movement in the last 10 years with incredibly negative uh, uh, inputs on Italy, which I regret I haven't been able to stop him from doing, but you know, is and 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 so it's not only a matter of being dumb or being smart. It's also a matter where your emotion interests are. The point is that always and everywhere, a large chunk of society will approach politics on the basis of their guts, of their feelings, of their emotion, of um, mythological images, on the desire of belonging to the winning faction. So did you notice that every time in every country, when somebody wins the election or become president, then they become popular? Have you ever noticed they teach you in school? You just look at the data. It's a fact. No matter who it is, in the periods after they win some political competition, they become more popular. Always. Of about how much? Eh, sometimes 10, 12, sometimes 20, 25 percentage point. That's a lot. What does it mean? It means that there is a portion of the population that just wants to stay with the winning team, with the winning guy, with the strong guy. It doesn't matter what that guy wants to do. The pure fact that he has won or she has won, okay, makes the person more popular. So that's the realism, the, the reality of the facts you have to start with, from, which means how do you interact with these people? You see, that's, that's, a, that's the crucial point. It goes beyond the IQ, but the IQ was, I mean, it's very easy to see, but it's not just, um, just the IQ. Thank you, Professor. Um, moving, if you're okay, with to the consequence of populism on society, I have a question from Giovanni, which is very specific. I'll post it also in the chat. It, uh, he asks whether do you think that there is a relation between populism and the problem of global climate change and what this relation is? The relation between populism and global climate change? Is that what he's asking? Or yes. crime? I didn't understand if you climate, said... Climate. Climate. I also posted it on the chat if you want to look at it again. Okay, okay. No, frankly not. Why? I mean, I, I, I don't see why. I mean, all the example I gave you historically of populism, right? They... Um, they've happened and then nothing, there was no issue about climate change. So why would you expect the thing to be relevant today. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I'm, you have to tell me why in your mind that particular problem. Um, yes, I will keep you updated if I get an answer from Giovanni in the right, chat. Right. Uh, maybe my hunch would be uh, Trump uh, uh, withdrawing from the Paris agreement of climate change. I don't know if that could be what he was Trump did, Trump. but the five star did not. You see, that's actually, thank you. That's a perfect example. So the answer now I can qualify it scientifically. It's not, right? Why? Because we had one character that we certainly have no doubt in qualifying as populist, Trump, right? That sold to his electorate that we drove him from the Paris Accord and doing some nasty things to the environment is... Uh. Professor, you're muted. I don't know why. Oh, no, no, it was me. I was, uh, uh, I was cleaning something because when I talk too close to the thing, and, uh, you know, the, not the thing we know, my, my screen becomes full of, um, what was that called? Aerosol with polite words and I hate to say it. So I wipe it, I was, was wiping it away. Anyhow, so Trump, you know, in the, in the populism of Trump, there was this miraculous uh, thing. His electorate, the people that voted for him, the, the portion of America he said he cared about would have become rich uh, and, 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 and better off if we gave up on any tentative to, to, to slow down global warming, right? And so he acted in that form. If you read the, uh, and if you follow the Five Star Movement, the message is exactly the opposite. By going completely bananas on ecological thing, on giving up on any decent form of energy, on giving up on industrialization, uh, you know, uh, we actually would become rich and better off. They're both lying, obviously, 
right? By <laughs> you don't make uh, America better by giving up on uh, pollution control and so on, and you don't make Italy more productive and richer by going back to middle age technologies or uh, by subsidizing every solar plant somebody uh, proposes. So no, I don't think uh, there is a causation as the, the example show. It could be that in Italy, the thing has been used to, to suggest. Yeah, so let me elaborate a bit. You see the fact I said before, one problem is that populist points of view have, uh, have actually won the cultural debate and it's a global thing. One thing that shocks me whenever I come to Italy, and I just came back yesterday, um, last night, uh, and I've been there for a long time, longer than I expected because of COVID, my father and this and that, is how completely out of their mind Italians are about food uh, and environmental issues. How they have a completely distorted perception of that from GMO to their food, you know, the fact that you go to the supermarket and everything is all made in Italy with Italian products. <laughs> it's a pathetic form of populist, uh, ridiculous provincialism. But it's become the global view. Everybody believes in that. They all, they all think that, ah, you know, if it is Italian, it's certainly natural. I mean, Italian, the country most known in Europe for uh, uh, food scandals. The European community started to heavily regulate a production of all kinds of food, starting to follow uh, uh, Italian uh, disasters in the 70s about wine. Counterfeit wine, you know, uh, all kinds of things were done in Italy. But this is not to say that Italy is the place again, but it's just that there is a country where. Uh, um, we are not a good example, but still Italians are absolutely convinced of this. And on this, they've built this idea that, oh, if we, if we, if we all had, you know, the return to the good old days, then uh, we would have all these tourists that they will come and make us rich. Totally insane. But this is a commonly accepted basis. Everybody in Italy believes that. Then they have Venice. Well, you're actually studying in Venice, if I'm not uh, incorrect, right? So they preach this this mythological nonsense, and then you do Venice, which is the negation of all that. It's the, the true destruction of, of a city, of a culture, of a, just to get a few bucks. And, but it's this, this is the foundation of then having the, the, the Toninelli that says, you know, if we if we turn the ilva into some ecological plant, then Taranto will become uh, the Hong Kong of the future, or something like that. Maybe not no, Hong Kong. They don't like uh, you choose San Francisco. San Francisco is very beautiful and very rich, so I guess, and it's also very unpolluted. So, so no, no, honestly, uh, it's a bit it's a bit more subtle than that, and if it is true, it's true for Italy, but not in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I have more questions for you. What, this Give me a second. I'm going to go get a bottle of water. I'll be back in a second. Can you, can you do that? Can you give me a second? Sorry, sorry. yes, I was muted. Yes, of course. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, guys, thank you for staying for us until 8 p.m. Um, really really pleased considering also how we started um yeah it, and thank you for participating so much like i love all your questions and i can't wait to ask them i'm sorry if i'm asking them for you just as before i'm a bit afraid of unmuting people uh but yeah thank you Uh, yes, uh, the conference, uh, I, I think I will have to discuss this with Ludovico, uh, um, 
because but I think we will we might manage to um, to also publish the, the recording of the of the conference. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so here we go our question by Fabio. Uh, do you think that there is a relationship between the presence of populist leadership and how states dealt with the COVID emergency? Hey, no, come on. It's a causal, Beatrice, think about. I mean, uh, you said it was Fabio making it, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's a pure matter of time. COVID is one year old, one year and two months. Rinaldi existed before, Grillo existed before. Grillo has existed since what? Since when Craxi got him fired from Rai because he actually made a good joke. Do you guys know the story? No, I, I don't. You should. You'll find evidence of that if you look on YouTube and you look for Grillo people, Baudo, Batuta, su Craxi. So in the middle eighties, you see that's, that's, that's an example of an elite that has given up completely to its role and, and it's so rapacious and so eager. I have an extremely negative opinion of Bettino Craxi and all his followers. They were extremely damaging to the country. Um, and so when at the, at the peak of his power, the guy invented this mission to China, it was pure propaganda. Didn't get anything, but it was in the style of a satrap, right? So the old 747, Paid the Italian taxpayer, took a whole circus of friends, lovers, uh, girlfriends, boyfriends, and whatnot to China in this propaganda tour that lasted, I think, a week or more. And this was very sad. So Grillo at that time was, uh, was just a buffoon, not even very funny. Well, not the exchange, he's still a buffoon. Uh, but anyhow, officially was a buffoon and he went on, on Rai. And, uh, and so in a Show is there with this guy called Pippo Baudo. I suppose you know the character. Pippo Baudo was very careful and politically uh, paying attention to all equilibria. And so it's very beautiful if you see the, the piece on YouTube. I think it's still black and white because you can see the Baudo notices where the joke is going. He realizes that it's dangerous and he tries to stop the other one and the other one just keeps going because he likes the joke. And the joke is the following. So they, you know who Claudio Martelli was? He's still around, he, you know, he should shut up, but he speaks sometimes. He was essentially Craxi right hand and, 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 and accomplice, uh, one, of the, one of the many accomplices together with the Michaelis and many other in this robbery that gave us Berlusconi as an outcome. Um, and so the joke has that, uh, I'll say it in Italian, it comes out better. Martelli goes to Craxi after a couple of days are there. Uh, he says, Bettino, ma sono davvero tutti socialisti? I cinesi, sì, sì, ma c'è socialismo, tutti sono socialisti. Ma proprio tutti, tutti, cioè, miliardo e duecento milioni che non i cinesi sono tutti socialisti. Ma sì, Claudio, lo vedi, c'è la bandiera rossa per tutto, poi li abbiamo incontrati, cioè, certo, sono tutti socialisti, assolutamente socialisti. Ma Bettino, non è possibile. E, ma Claudio, sì, ma Bettino, a chi cazzo rubano? And this, literally, created the move. If you don't believe me, the move, the, the, cinque, the, 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 the five star movement, the cinque star, whatever it's called, Movement was created by this and the fact that G Grillo, after I think a few days, was just fired by Rai. Mr. Craxi heard of the joke, the joke had a great success, circulated. I was, I think I was in the United States, but somebody told the joke to me or wrote me about. I thought quite good. And that's when it started to work uh, go to the square, go to the theaters. Pieces of Italian history. Um, so no, I don't think it's COVID, my friend. COVID may have accentuated. COVID is a very different argument. I'm still thinking about it. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that it shows. COVID is, if you want, is another example, is another example of how society like ours, very advanced, uh, very educated, and, 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 but on the other end, where everybody has the right to participate in the public debate, 
can get prey of fanatism of one kind or another when the elites up again abdicate to their role. In this case, the medical and political elite. The panic of Western society and the mismanagement uh, of the whole process, apart from the research that created the vaccines, uh, is a good example of how populism can, uh, but, but doesn't coincide, it's not the cause, but it's, it's another example of how populism can spread. And, and I've been spending quite a few hours recently, and I hope to spend more to try to understand why democracies in Asia, like Japan and India, uh, or Taiwan have not been prey of the same form of panic uh, that we have had and why certain European countries like Norway, Sweden, Denmark, but not only have, have managed it differently. And why, for example, Ger the Ger Germany has managed it in a certain way for a while and then in another. Uh, and uh, I honestly do not know, I don't have an answer, but I think it's quite remarkable that uh, that we have been uh, overtaken by emotions in many countries. And obviously Italy has been probably, again, the worst from that point of view, but, uh, but it's not been the only one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will see also the development of this pandemics and the political scenario in the future as well. Uh, I have a question from Alice uh, who asked, uh, um, how could elite win the cultural debate against populism if you were to mention some main strategies? Also uh, mentioning today's- I don't think it's a matter of elites. strategies. How is it that at the end, the Germany, the, the, the German political debate is still very rational and, and, and completely different from ours? It's a complex of things, right? There's not a strategy, it's not that somebody has to elaborate a strategy. This is really social capital. The press behaves in a certain way. They don't write the nonsense that Corriere della Sera or Repubblica, the German TV is not filled daily by politicians bullshitting without control. Um, politicians resign when they're afraid. Look at the Dutch example. You think they, they you know, we, we we, we, we don't value these things enough. I mean, it's, it's gigantic having a prime minister that resigns, not because of his mistake, but actually because a piece of the bureaucracy of the state has made a mistake. That is, it takes responsibility for the state. You understand? No Italian politician ever has ever taken responsibility for a piece of the Italian bureaucracy misfunctioning. Did you ever see a, an interior ministry in front of a police brutality say, I resign? Because they are a piece of the state and I am the one in charge right now and therefore I resign. That's what the, 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 the Dutch prime minister did. The piece of the bureaucracy that screwed up was not even dependent from him. You know, this was the, essentially like the analogous of the Italian Agenzia delle Entrate uh, carrying out a, a, a anti-evasion campaign in the wrong way, illegal at the end, erroneous, and recognizing it after a year or so, I don't remember. And the prime minister says, oh my God, I'm at fault because a piece of the state has not done things right, therefore I resign. That sends the population a remarkable message right? Your elite is responsible, is in charge, accept to be in charge, recognizes the fact. So it's not a strategy. It's, it's a matter of, it's what uh, Putin and another call social capital. I mean, you can call it social capital, like you can call it the norm system, the, 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 the value system of the country, and I mean, you can call it in very different ways. But So I don't think you can elaborate a strategy. Uh, you can advocate action. You can invite people to, you know, I remember when they you know, start a campaign. I, I don't drive through red light. I don't park on uh, illegally. I don't uh, 
throw paper on the street. I don't uh, let the police abuse of their power. I, what was the thing that uh, I saw the other day? Yesterday, actually, Frankfurt. Yeah, so apparently on some Italian train. Uh, a girl, black, I think, or North African, has a cold. And she sneezes a few times. She's wearing the mask and everything. And she sneezes a few times. The lady sitting in front starts yelling at her that she's uh, infecting everybody, that she's got COVID and this and that. And it is these damn Africans that come here. And, and uh, now somebody will cut off this piece and say, hey, there you go, Baldrini is a racist. He just said damn African. Um, uh, uh, that they are responsible for uh, the contagion of the getting to the point of forcing the girl to leave the train. Somebody that is not even clear if he was so because the story has it. So first of all, nobody react. You see social capital. Nobody reacts to defend the girl in front of the aggression. Nobody. Everybody shutting up. Perfect Italian style. Country of cowards. Then the lady stands up, go looking for somebody, capotreno, and shows up with somebody that qualifies himself as a capotreno and forces the girl down. At the next station, she's pushed outside the, down from the train. This is social capital. Okay? Now, could things like this happen in other countries? Maybe. It just happens to have. Uh, to, to occur quite frequently in, uh, uh, in ours. So no, there is uh, no other strategy than just repeating the facts and, uh, and trying to play the role that the elite should have, which is in this case to intervene, to say, no, you're a damn racist, you know, and the things you're saying are, you should not say, you should apologize and you should leave this girl alone. Thank you. And I think related to this change in behavior of the elite, I had a question before uh, asking if we can do something and what we can do to make the elites more responsible and, uh, you know, not going towards populism. Like, is there something that we as individual or as voters can do? What I said, we'll do this. You know, it's, it's, it's a day by day. You can certainly start up, uh, you know, I do my part. I come to debate like this. I say the things explicitly. I don't back up. I, uh, when I have the opportunity of doing research on this or writing things that I believe to be, how can I say, worth listening, I, 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 I try to, to do that. But uh, yeah, that's what we, we can do. We can... Uh, uh, we can certainly create coalition. I mean, we, 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 I like to think that uh, one day the Italian will be able, or from the Italian you, from people like you, you know, because you are the elite. You better, you better don't run away from that. You know, it's not that, where is the elite? Well, the elite is me, the elite is you, okay? Look at the mirror, you see a piece of the elite, all right? It's not some rich, the Benedetti uh, character. Uh, the elite is made of the top five, ten percent of the population, not in terms of coins, but in terms of uh, qualification and, uh, and culture and, and, and so on. So you part of the elite. Uh, yeah, one can dream of uh, a movement coming out from Italian universities say we want to be a different country. We want, we want to, to spread a certain set of values and we want to call people responsible uh, uh, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. It would be great. But as you notice, we have had the Sardine and they were just a silly instrument to, to get somebody elected and then disappear. And a couple of good looking guys going on TV and uh, replacing Garby or something. I have become, with age, I've become very pessimist. I think it's deeply ingrained in Italian culture. It's learned. It's something you learn when you are a kid and then you think you're smart because 
to play the game. And individually you are, if you are part of that, you know, think about a, 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 a low life idiot like Borghi. Literally, huh? the guy is dumb, he's a failure. He's the son of a rich man that had a, uh, one of the Milano agenti di cambio that won, did a good job, the father, sold a little company, very profitable, to Deutsche Bank. This is all public information, all you have to do, you know, attaches the condition of the sale to Deutsche Bank, the fact that the son had to be hired and kept for a number of years, which he did. I'm sure, I'm sure Borghi thinks of himself as a very smart, cool guy. He's very furbo. If you don't get rid of that from common culture, you never become the Netherlands. End the story. If you keep cheating on your exam, you cheat on your exam. Um, now, I would like to ask regarding this, if uh, you feel like young people um have some i don't know advantage uh opposed to as opposed to uh people whose culture uh, is embedded in this uh institutional system yeah obviously you do by definition right well you're younger certain habits are less ingrained uh Some of you have been going around the world and seeing things, and therefore you may have learned or you may notice that, yes, indeed, in some countries they do behave differently. And that is especially social enforcement. Again, you see, we are a Catholic country. We think that things can be solved by preaching. Let me tell you another brutal thing that is true about humans. Um, Preaching is not the way in which you change people's mind. It's with facts and with incentive. Preaching is relevant at the margin. I am sure that after this beautiful debate, I didn't change any mind here. I may have enforced or strengthened, sorry, not enforced, I may have strengthened some points of view, provided some with arguments, become more irritable, irritant to other. Some may have even felt offended because I said, Borg is dumb, he's dumb. He's actually also a coward. If you meet him for coffee before a TV show, he's all, you know, professor, professor. Yeah, go away. All right. So yes, young people have this advantage. They, They're more flexible and they have a bigger, longer future in front. So at 15, 18, you have a lot of years in front of you, about 70 useful years at a minimum. It's worth investing in doing things better. At 40 or fewer, 60 even less, at 65, as many people tell me, look, why the hell you spend time talking to Italians? Just come to Hong Kong and have fun. And they do have a point. Right? So that's your advantage. In the specific groups, you have another advantage. You're clearly all well educated and smart, and you're, you're doing a, a particular kind of uh, university experience, which is risky, but signals a certain passion for learning. So you got chances, but chances are half of you will emigrate, like I did. I emigrated in self-defense. It was pure self-defense. I looked around, I looked my left, I looked my right. I said, if I remain here, either I kiss butts or I go nowhere. Better go where they don't need me to kiss their butt. So I gave it a try. It was pure self-defense. Nothing else. Thank you, Professor. Uh, especially, I mean, I... I sort of recognize myself in this final comment. So <laughs> um, I wrote in the chat that if anyone wants to ask some final comments, we we'll, could keep going, let's say, um, 
a little bit less than 10 minutes longer. Uh, otherwise, if there are no other questions, maybe I would ask to Ludovico, since he was the one who invited Professor Michele Boudin to talk to us today, to say some final words. Um, so yeah, Ludovico, I have no more questions here in the chat right now. Uh, well, I didn't prepare this part. I mean, uh, are you sure that I should? Surprise. Uh, um, no, basically, um, I would like to thank all the people who have remained uh, with us, if there is no nothing else to say. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, let's say, um, yeah, um, Professor Baldrin, uh, if uh, I, I uh, have something else, uh, uh, to say related to the IQ because uh, I didn't make myself very clear in the second part of my question. So okay, um, if I may send you an email afterwards, whatever. Uh, and sure, yeah, sure. in a sense. Um, okay, so this is our first um, discussion. Say it's, it was an experiment. I believe that despite everything that. Um, went uh, on at the beginning. Uh, I'm really pleased to have. Uh, I was really pleased <laughs> to have. Uh, you may want to tell your 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 friends what you refer to. I, I, I mean, I, Professor, we had the first link hacked uh, by some people who were just making a lot of noise, and that's why we sent see, another I link. See. Yeah, I it see. was a bit. <laughs> Maybe it's good that you arrive later, actually. Uh, well, there are a number of people that don't like me at all, so it might be that. Uh, I don't know. They, well, whatever. And it, I mean, it was just an um, unpleasant experience, let's say. I mean, uh, whatever. All right, all right. Well, but, um, we it and Zoom worked. It did. And thank you very much for joining us and for holding this debate with us. Uh, Although virtually, uh, unlikely, maybe we will be able to host you in Kafoska at some point. But you're in Venice, I can, we can meet when June comes, I should be back. Awesome, <laughs> that, that would be great. We, we could organize a throwback. Actually, given that, that, that we are here, uh, let me ask, then you can debate. Let me actually say, then you can debate this privately. Uh, I would not mind if once you circulate to have the recording of the video, uh, if there are no objections. People may have privacy issues, so in that case, uh, I will not. Uh, but, uh, but if you have no objection, uh, I think it could be interesting for, for others to listen. Yeah, you, I, you, figure out, you figure it out yourself. Of, you course, know, uh, of course, of course. Just saying it publicly that, uh, you know, I, 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 it doesn't have to be tomorrow, it could be in a week or whatever. I don't know if you want to circulate through your channels or not, it doesn't matter. Um, and if you yes. want, if you think that some parts are very private or strong, you you know, with the, I have no objection to remove them. That's understandable. I think we will we'll discuss it for sure yeah, with the VDS boards and make sure that everyone is okay. But I'm pretty sure that uh, some people, it, when the recording started, people had to uh, accept it. So, um, yeah. I, yeah, I yeah, but people accept the recording. It's not obvious that they accept to be distributed. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, we'll make sure of that, um, certainly. All right. Okay. Good talking to you. I apologize for my delay, but I, as I said, literally, I thought it was Sunday and instead it was Saturday that we had agreed, which means probably tomorrow I have another one that I'm forgetting. So I better go check my. Yes, with Rick Dufer. Oh, no, I know, but that Rick is a regular at. Uh, okay. you know, no, no, there might be another one with some other group. Yeah. You know, Rick, uh, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Flash Enjoy. Day. Be serious and keep studying. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you. Goodbye. And Have a good bye, day. everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.